Okay, well, thank you all very much for being here today. And um, the, I guess this tract is something new this year that uh, Joe Lex and a couple other people put together, and they wanted to have a tract where it was all about what they say cringe-inducing triage notes. So how many of you ever have patients with chest pain who come in with this report of a recent negative stress test, and maybe you feel a little bit like this? Anybody? Or perhaps like this when you look at the triage note. I, I think a lot of us have been there and are there every day. So I'm going to spend a little time talking about, uh, talking about that 55-year-old man. And I'm going to actually present a real case. And this patient happened to be 63, so we'll change the title just a little bit. It's a real case. Put yourself in the shoes of the emergency physicians that are taking care of this patient. I'm sure you've seen this patient before. If there's residents here, you will be taking care of this patient before too long. And I happened to be working over at one of our affiliate hospitals, Mercy, when this patient came in. And fortunately, I wasn't the one taking care of this patient when uh, he came in. So 63-year-old guy is visiting inner city Baltimore. He was actually visiting Baltimore's inner harbor uh, on one weekend day with his 70-year-old girlfriend. So they were at the harbor, and they're having a very nice time. Baltimore's inner harbor is a big tourist destination for the mid-Atlantic. And um, while he was at the harbor, he had a brief episode of right arm and hand pain, and he also broke out in a sweat. Symptoms lasted for maybe about 10, 15 minutes or so, and uh, he didn't really do anything. But then as they're getting ready to head back up to Philadelphia, which is about a two-hour drive from downtown Baltimore, his girlfriend convinced him to come into the, one of the local emergency departments. So they came on into Mercy Hospital just to get checked out. And when he came in, he was completely asymptomatic. Now, one of my colleagues got this information from his doctor in, in Philly, that he had had two recent negative stress tests. One was a persantine valve, the other was a cestamibi, within the past six months, and both had been read as negative, according to the cardiologist she spoke with. Despite these two negative stress tests, the cardiologist took him to the cath lab uh, and did an angiogram. I'm not sure why the angiogram after two negative stress tests maybe had good insurance. I don't know. So anyway, they took him for an angiogram, and despite these two negative stress tests, he ended up having a 70% RCA lesion and an LAD that was less than 50% obstructed. So that's the first takeaway point here about this case, is that he's had two negative stress tests and yet has a 70% lesion on his calf. Anyway, he comes into the emergency department. Uh, we get a quick EKG. The EKG is read as normal. Get an old EKG, and it's pretty much unremarkable. There's no tricks up here, okay? It's, just, it's a normal EKG. He gets a bunch of labs. He gets uh, one, maybe two sets of cardiac enzymes. Everything's good. Now, darkness is approaching. And he says to the doc, you know what? It's getting late. We've got a two-hour drive back up I-95 to Philadelphia. We'd really like to get going, so can you please discharge us? Well, he's looking pretty good. Right arm and hand pain, that's not cardiac. You know, he's had an angiogram that they didn't do anything with, so that's probably fine to go ahead and discharge him. So he gets discharged after the labs and negative enzymes. He sits out in the waiting room while his girlfriend, 70 years old, is looking for the car for 45 minutes. She's walking up and down the parking garage looking for this car. Maybe she's got a little dementia. She doesn't know where this car is, right? Fortunately, because he's out in the waiting room, and now he starts developing some recurrent right arm and hand pain. But nobody does anything. Then he starts getting a little pale and diaphoretic, slumps down in his chair. No one does anything. He's been discharged. Going to have to re-register. Right? So, so then he starts slumping down a little bit more. And then the one thing happens that immediately calls attention to the charge nurse, the triage nurse, security, overhead stat pages to housekeeping. He vomits. So immediately he gets brought back in to the emergency department. They quickly repeat an EKG. He's got tombstones across his precordium. About a minute later, he loses pulses. He gets quickly defibrillated. He ended up surviving. He went cross town over to university where he went to the cath lab. And it wasn't the 70% RCA lesion that was the infarct-related artery. It was the less than 50% LAD, which is now 100% obstructed. And he ended up doing fine. And his girlfriend did eventually find the car. All right. So, but it's a good thing that somebody was looking out for this guy because had she found the car right away, he would have been on I-95 heading north when he had his cardiac arrest. So what exactly is going on here? This guy's had two negative stress tests. He's had a cath. I thought that provocative and invasive testing was the gold standard. In fact, provocative invasive testing is about as all-American in ACS workup as baseball, motherhood, and apple pie. Right. Well, you know what? I've said this before. As you get older, 
you start realizing that a lot of things in life that you thought were good and pure turn out to not quite be so good and pure <laughs> after all. All right. So what, what exactly is the deal with provocative invasive testing? So I changed the title of this talk. We're actually going to talk about how provocative invasive testing are more the bron tarnished bronze standard compared to the gold standard. Okay? And although the title of this talk is about stress testing, I think we can't talk about stress testing without talking about some of the limitations of angiography as well. Because that's another problem that we run into when patients say, yeah, I've had a recent negative or normal cath. What exactly does that mean? So let's talk a little bit about this. Let me pose a question to you. Right? Let's say you walk in the room, you do your good history of present illness, you come walking out of the room, and you're concerned about that patient. And then you go over to the computer and you find out that this patient recently had a negative stress test. How comfortable do you feel with sending that person home now? What if it turns out that the patient tells you, or maybe the calf, there's a cath report in there, that the cath was pretty much unremarkable? Right? How comfortable do you feel with sending that patient home now, who after your history you were really concerned about? Well, let me ask you the part of this question by telling you what I learned about angiography back when I was in residency. And I'll bet a lot of people here probably learned the same thing. What's the purpose of angiography? Well, I learned that the purpose of angio was to identify a big plaque because big plaques are at risk for rupture. And the classic teaching is you need to worry about plaques when they're at least 70% obstructive of the luminal diameter. And you still hear the cardiologists talk about this magical 70% number. I had recently asked a head of clinical cardiology at university uh, probably about three years ago, I said, when do you guys worry about plaques? And he said, 70%. That's the magic number that people start to worry about. If they're smaller than that, they're oftentimes considered non-significant. Certainly, if they're less than 50%, it's considered minimal disease. What's the purpose of stress testing? Well, stress testing essentially is a non-invasive way of seeing how big somebody's plaque is. You take a patient, you plop them on a treadmill or do some other type of maneuver to increase their myocardial oxygen demand. Maybe you inject uh, dobutamine or some other type of presser to increase myocardial oxygen demand or a vasodilator. And what you want to see is whether the myocardial oxygen demand can meet the supply. If the demand doesn't meet the supply, then the patient's going to develop some symptoms, maybe some EKG abnormalities, or on imaging studies, you might get some abnormalities on nuclear medicine scans, maybe a stress echo, whatever it is. So the idea is you stress the heart or you produce a vas give them a vasodilator, and you want to see whether the myocardial oxygen demand can meet the supply. There's some problems, though. If you actually look in the literature, what you find is that that gold standard provocative test is only about 85% sensitive. There are no stress tests which are better than about 95, 96%. Now, as an aside, every time a new type of stress test comes out, it's 100%. And then over the course of a few years, it starts to fall. And usually they all settle right around 85% including the very best stress tests that your cardiologists try to promote. They're also very reader dependent. It depends who's reading it. If you look at the studies that talk about how great some stress tests are, it's interesting to note that if there's equivocal result, how many of you have ever read a stress test result and there's some type of equivocation in there, you know, breast attenuation artifact, I'm not really, you know, non-definite uh, non type of stress test interpretations. In the studies, they just toss them out of the study. You can't do that with your patient, though, can you? Toss them out. Well, you had an, an equivocal stress test. Get out of my ER. You can't, you can't really do that, all right? Other problems with stress testing is that what we now know, and this is based on literature over the past 10, 15 years, is that it's actually the smaller plaques which are more at risk for rupture. Those are the ones that are more unstable. In fact, the literature indicates that two-thirds of MIs are actually caused by plaques that are less than 50% obstructive of the luminal diameter. Not the 70, 80, 90 percent plaques, but two-thirds of MIs occur in infarct-related arteries where the plaque was less than 50 percent occlusive before the rupture and MI actually happened. And those plaques will give you a negative stress test. All right? So this is a little model for, uh, for, stre for what coronary vessels uh, look like. And if you look at the top plaque, that's a, about an 80 percent size lesion. Right? That's a person with chronic stable angina. That person's got a positive stress test. That person will have a calf that's read as significantly positive. The lumen at the bottom, the vessel at the bottom, has about a 50% plaque. That gives you a negative stress test. 
That gives you a calf that's read as minimal disease or non-significant disease. What we now know is that it's actually the plaque at the bottom, which is usually the unstable one. The plaque at the bottom is two-thirds of the time the cause of the acute MI because it's not about the size of the plaque. It's about the composition of the plaque. In other words, how thick is the fibrous cap and how much lipid is there in the core? The one at the top is very calcified. That one doesn't tend to rupture. Here's a, a histologic section. Obviously, this person didn't do well since they cut out a piece of his artery. But this is a histologic section of a very, very stenosed lumen. And if you look at the little white area at the bottom, that's lipid core. And it's covered by a very thick blue fibrous cap. There's no way this is going to rupture. This is a stable plaque, even though it's very stenosed. On the other hand, if you look at this plaque, this is a fairly patent lumen, and there's a huge lipid core covered by a very, very thin fibrous cap. This is a volcano about to blow. This is the unstable plaque that causes two-thirds of MIs, and yet this lumen produces a negative stress test and oftentimes gets read with an angio of non-significant or minimal disease. Problems with angiography, well, what about angio? Angio only tells you about the size of a plaque. It doesn't tell you anything about the composition of the plaque. It doesn't tell you how big the lumen is. It, I mean, it does tell you how big the lumen is, but not about uh, how thick the fibrous cap is and not about the size of the lipid core. In fact, here's a great review article from the internal medicine literature that goes through all the different reasons a patient can have a false negative cap. Take a look at this. Diffuse disease can give you a false negative cath reading. Aorta osteolite, branch osteolite, overlapping side branches, left main coronary artery disease. That's the big one. Not the little old LAD, but the big one, the left main. Right? You guys remember Sanford and Son? Whenever he used to say, oh, I'm having the big one. This is the big one he was talking about, the left main. All right, that's before some of your times. Eccentric plaques, congenital coronary. And I have to say, the incoming interns in this rising class were, on average, born in 1986. Can you believe that? That's scary. All right. Anyway, congenital coronary, um, coronary vessel enlargement, which now is oftentimes referred to as coronary artery remodeling. It's a relatively new concept in atherogenesis, something I never learned about, many of you never learned about, many of your cardiologists never learned about this in med school or residency either. And yet this is something that the pathologists have been talking about for the past 15 years. Pathologists have known about this for a long time. What do they say about the, uh, the pathologists? Pathologists know everything, but just a day too late. Right. So, um, so what exactly is coronary artery remodeling? It's a new concept in atherogenesis. And there's new technology, we've spoken about this before, but new technology called intravascular ultrasound, which has identified some very interesting things about how plaques grow. And we're not going to get into detail about intravascular ultrasound, but just to let you know, ultrasound now has come so far that they can take ultrasound probes and put them on the tip of a catheter and feed them into a vessel lumen and look at a plaque in the coronary artery from the inside out. Now, I showed you the traditional model for how plaques grow. Traditionally, we learned that as plaques grow, they grow from the vessel wall into the lumen and cause obstruction. What we now actually know from intravascular ultrasound studies is as, as, as plaques grow, they don't grow into the vessel lumen. During the majority of the life of a plaque, it actually grows backwards into the vessel wall and spares the lumen. So you can have a big plaque and yet a normal lumen. And remember, angio only looks at the lumen. Stress testing only tells you about the lumen. So here's an intravascular ultrasound. I'll blow this up for you. And this is a normal intravascular ultrasound. You've got a three millimeter lumen across and a nice big thick adventitia. So there's the adventitia, nice normal lumen. This little circle right there is just a reflection of the electrode, so you can ignore that. In contrast, this is a very diseased vessel. And that arrow is pointing at a huge plaque which is growing eccentrically into the vessel wall, causing outward bulging or remodeling of the vessel wall, sparing the lumen. Now, this big diseased vessel, what does this look like on an angiogram? Here's the angiogram. There's section A, section B. This is red. Again, section A, section B. This is red as completely normal LAD. 
And looking at this artery, this angiogram, you would have no idea that there's actually a huge plaque sitting right outside that arrow at section B. Here's a few more from the, uh, from the cardiac literature. This is read as near normal RCA or near normal LAD, and yet there's actually a huge plaque growing eccentrically into the vessel wall, causing outward bulging of the wall. Here's another one. This is read as near normal RCA, and the intravascular ultrasound that corresponds shows a big plaque growing eccentrically into the vessel wall. You have no idea, looking at an angiogram, that there's actually a big plaque sitting out there. And by the way, these are going to give you a normal stress test because there's a nice patent lumen. All right. What are the other problems with cornea angiography? You can't tell if somebody's had a recent plaque rupture. What's it called if somebody has a plaque and it ruptures, but it doesn't completely occlude the lumen? That's called unstable angina, right? Plaque rupture followed by not total occlusion of the lumen. That's called unstable. That's your classic mechanism for unstable angina. All right. Well, let me give you a case here. Here's a 49-year-old guy that was visiting Baltimore on a business trip. Again, this is another real case. 49-year-old guy visited Baltimore uh, from, I think, Phoenix. And he came in with chest pain, shortness of breath, diaphoresis. EKG's unremarkable. It gets better with nitroglycerin. And um, despite the fact that his EKG's unremarkable, they say, you know what? You've got good insurance. We're taking you for cath. All right. <laughs> so they take this guy to the cath lab. And he's got 40% RCA, 20% left circulations, minimal disease. So his diagnosis is reflux. Here's your PPI. You can go home. He's discharged. So two days later, business trip's done. He flies back to Arizona. He's getting out of the airport, heading, driving home in his car in Phoenix, and he develops recurrent chest pain. So instead of heading home, he just goes to a local emergency department. They repeat the EKG. He's having an inferior STEMI. And they take this guy to the cath lab, and he's now got a 100% RCA. He went from 40 to 100% in two days. How can that happen? Well, if you look at the intravascular ultrasound of somebody with a 40% lesion, these arrows are showing big plaque growing eccentrically into the vessel wall. And the corresponding angiogram, there's your 40% lesion. And so when you look at an angiogram that shows a 40% lesion, does that mean that the patient's got 40% lesion and they've had a 40% lesion for five years and this is stable? Or does it mean that today they have a 40% lesion and yesterday it was 10 or 20%? It just recently ruptured and tomorrow it'll be 100%. The angiogram doesn't tell you about recent plaque rupture. And if you look at the intravascular ultrasound, you'll notice that the borders are very jagged. There's no plaque anymore. There, there's no fibrous cap anymore. Very, very jagged borders. The fibrous cap is gone. It ruptured already. This is a ticking time bomb waiting to completely occlude that lumen, which is exactly what happened in this particular case. Now, let me also just present to you a must-have article. This is one that came from York that Dave Vega, who's one of our members and board of directors, published. This is an article that you've got to have. All right. This is published in Western Journal of Emergency Medicine, 122 patients with chest pain. What they did was they looked at patients that had negative uh, recent stress tests within the past three years, and they looked at their rule-in rate when they came back complaining of chest pain. 122 patients came in with negative stress tests of various types. All right, 20% ruled in for significant coronary disease. Significant defined as either they ruled in for an MI during this visit, they had another stress test which is positive during this visit, they had cath, which required a PCI, or they went for cabbage, or they just flat out died. Significant CAD. All right? 20% ended up rolling in. And by the way, 24% of those patients had their recent stress test within the past month. Very, very nice article that you've got to get. All right? This is one of the open access journals. You can pull this up off the Internet by just Google searching this. So my kudos to, to Dave Vega and his, his buddies in, in York who did this study. It's a very important study which demonstrates everything that we've been, ta been talking about. Now, I'm not trying to tell you that negative stress tests and negative cath are useless. All right? They certainly do risk stratify people to lower levels. But the problem is that all too often people look at these negative stress tests or negative caths and they think that it risk stratifies the patient to zero. And it does not. There's no test or combination of tests that risk stratify to zero. There's nothing that eliminates the risk. 
there's always some degree of risk. And if you make the mistake of, of making the assumption that the negative stress test ought to obviate your concern, then this is the kind of thing that might happen to you. This is a real case once again from a local hospital. 56-year-old woman comes to the ED with substernal pressure, diaphoresis, and belching. Now, any one of us could sell that for an admission right off the bat, right? Even with an unremarkable EKG. Diaphoresis, substernal pressure, two huge red flags. That patient's coming in for sure, no doubt. The emergency physician plans to go ahead and admit this patient, but then calls up the primary care doc who says, oh, she's been having similar symptoms over the past couple months. So two months ago, she saw cardiology, and the patient got a negative stress test. So what she got? She's got reflux. Cardiology saw her, diagnosed her with reflux. So go ahead and send her home. So what do you do? Well, the emergency physician sent her home. Negative stress test. Next morning, the patient has a cardiac arrest and is found dead at home, and so a lawsuit is brought against the emergency physician. Again, this is a real case. Now, at that deposition, the plaintiff attorney looks right in the emergency physician's eyes and says, Doctor, didn't you know that stress testing is only 85% sensitive, and if you were worried based on your history of present illness, you should have admitted the patient to the hospital. Case settled at that moment. Again, real case. This says, Your Honor, before we settle on a judgment or not, we'd like to know how much money there is in the universe. Okay? You definitely, you don't want to be sitting in this courtroom. Okay? And what I'm seeing, and I think a lot of the other experts in this audience are seeing more and more cases against emergency physicians and even cardiologists are based on over-reliance on negative tests. What I'm seeing over the past five years or so, there's two major themes that account for the majority of of uh, litigation against emergency physicians for missed MI. Number one, diagnosis of reflux, which we're not going to talk about, but don't ever diagnose reflux without thinking twice. In fact, one of the things I always say is, before, whenever you write reflux on the chart of somebody with chest pain, you're about to send them home, just do yourself a big favor and just slap yourself, all right? Because if you don't, someone else will, all right? Think twice about that. The other one, I'm seeing more and more cases of patients with missed MI who were sent home, despite red flags on the chart, sent home because of a negative stress test or even the unremarkable calf. Be very careful. There's nothing that should obviate your concern when that history of present illness is concerning. Now, we're not going to get into future testing. This is a whole nother lecture. A lot of people are talking about other possible ways of testing. And the benefits of some of the newer testing modalities is that they tell you not only about the size of the lesion, but the composition. Here's a 45-year-old guy that had a negative stress test. He had a CTA. And what you notice up here, the lumen, uh, lumen doesn't look all that bad, but this huge, vague, dark bulge out here, that's a vessel wall. And the reason it's bulging outwards is because there's actually a big plaque sitting in that vessel wall. So some of these newer tests give you more information than just vessel occlusion. They tell you information about the composition of the plaque also. I'm not promoting CT. Again, that's a big another topic. It's a controversial topic also. But the bottom line is that your CT and your stress test, or, or your cath and your stress test, are not a gold standard. All right? So... Real quick, let's just go back and summarize. Again, the key point, when you're worried about the history of present illness, don't let any test or combination of tests obviate your concern. There's no test or combination of tests that risk stratify you to zero. There should always be a certain level of concern. And if you're really concerned coming out of the room, don't drop your risk to zero just because of that negative stress test or the negative cast. And remember, this is right out of the ACC AHA 2007 non-STEMI and STEMI and PCI guidelines, right out of the cardiology literature. Published in circulation, published in Journal of American College of Cardiology. The most predictive factor about whether your person is going to rule in or not is the history of present illness. Not risk factors, not prior workups. The most important thing you've got is your history of present illness. So don't ever obviate your concern just because of that HPI. If you remember the simple point, simple point, I think hopefully you'll be able to avoid the lawyers that are out there waiting for you. All right. Now, for anyone who wants a copy of these slides, if you go to this website at the top, you don't need to put www first. It's lectures.umem.org slash AAEM 2011. You can pull up those pictures from the cardiology litter of the intravascular ultrasounds and show that to your cardiology fellows or whoever else that's balking at you for your concern. All right? You can pull up those slides. Wait till the end of the week. We'll post these on our website.
All right? But feel free to do so. I think I'm out of time, but again, thank you very, very much for your attention, and I'm hand things back over to Mike. Thanks.